Thank you. Um, Viola Davis said when she won her Emmy this year, the only thing that separates women of colour from anyone else is opportunity. Um, I've often been reluctant, uh, deeply reluctant, to talk about diversity. I think it's because I've always wanted, felt better equipped to express my thoughts through, through the work itself. And I also wanted to talk as an artist first and not as a diverse representative. The reason for talking now is what I have seen working as an artistic director now for just over three years. Um, before I get into that, just a brief background. I studied drama at Hull University pre-fees. Um, it was hard enough then to persuade my parents to let me do an arts degree. I don't know whether in the current climate around higher ed education, whether I'd be able to convince them now. I then very fortunately received a bursary to do an Arts Council traineeship at Theatre Royal Stratford East. I say fortunately as the application specified recent graduates should not apply. I was very recent, uh, but egged on with by friends, I applied, I got an interview, which could have been because of the talent oozing out through my application, but I guess there was something around uh, my name. But as a result of these interventions by the Arts Council in the theatre, at a time when I was pretty uh, not very confident, I could begin a career in directing. My first impression of the industry was shock. I thought I'd walked into the last bastion of the British Empire. <laughs> as for the first time in my life, everything was related back to and reduced back to my ethnicity. But this was 20 years ago when things have changed. Uh, at <laughs> Irony, sorry, no. Uh, um, at the time, I was strongly advised to start an Asian theatre company as that would be the only way for me to have a, any real career. But if I was to have a career based on my ethnicity, I didn't want it. Anyway, many years of freelancing, I was deeply resistant to becoming an artistic director. Vehemently opposed, one could say. Um, I, think, I thought there were lots of reasons, but now looking back, um, I realised... It was probably more, it was probably a lot more to do with a lack of confidence and a deep rooted, rooted belief that I didn't have what it takes. What particularly helped when I started at the Tricycle was the mentoring, advice, and generosity offered by other artistic directors, particularly uh, Nick Heitner and Dominic Hook. The other big influence I had was the Claw Short course and a particular session, which was about risk, finance, and management. There was a talk about mission statements. This gave me the knowledge and confidence to completely rewrite the tricycles to encapsulate a new and specific vision, which repositioned the theatre and provided clarity for the organisation in its decision making. When I was interviewed at the beginning of my job um, uh, by a journalist, I was asked uh, what it was like to be one of the early BAME artistic female directors in London. I, uh, tell me what it's like being a white man, I said, then I'll tell you what it's like being an Asian woman. However, despite these frustrations, for me, the real answer to his question, as we all know, is that arts leaders, arts leaders of all diversity and variety, class, gender, race, uh, etc., leads to different tastes, different perspectives. And no clear example of that can be made than in my first production, which was Lolita Chakrabarti's first play, Red Velvet. This was a play about Ira Aldridge, the first black actor to play Shakespeare in Covent Garden in the 19th century, st starring Adrian Lester. We'd been working on it, the three of us, for, as freelancers for over seven years and had twice as many rejections. It took me to become an artistic director to get that play programmed, a play which has since won awards, gone to New York and is going to the Garrick this January. It took my taste and all the influences in my post to allow this play to have a life. Again, in my first season, all the leads were played by non-white actors, all the plays were directed by women. This was not social engineering, but stories I was naturally drawn to, presented by a community of artists that were my colleagues and comrades. This sounds straightforward and good, and you know, but here are some of the conundrums. It's not enough for the Arts Council artist buildings to engage with diversity. It requires the whole ecology of our industry to engage, to support. I want to give you an example, time is brief, but the tricycle, like many other theatres, is dependent on reviews and press profile for ticket sales and therefore survival. I've noticed a definite lack of interest from the mainstream press when the work is from a BAME art writer or predominantly features a BME cast or themes. I just directed the world premiere of A Wolf in Snakeskin Shoes by Marcus Gardley. 
So in a week when there were only two openings in London, what are we to think when one national paper tells us it doesn't have time to review it? And what are we to think when, even as they're saying this, they have no time to see the show, they ask for an interview with a high-profile white actress in a play we are opening next year? I don't think I'm being unusually sens sensitive when, as an artistic director, I see a direct correlation between national press interest, both in pre-stories and press reviewing, and the race content of the, show, of the play. Is this because they're responding to their readers' tastes? I'm not sure it is. For our audiences, have responded to all plays. And even if it is, do they not feel any responsibility to lead, to educate, to encourage diversity? I've learned something else about sustain, sustaining diverse leadership. If you're not from the right schools or universities, if you're not part of the establishment because you're from a recent immigrant background, when trouble hits, where do you get your support and advice from? Where are your networks? Who stands by you when the system doesn't like what you say? We live in volatile times in a very tight financial climate. Engagement in true diversity, by which I mean the telling of different stories and ownership of these stories is not easy. We need to talk about it without fear of judgment, accusations of isms, by which I mean racism, tokenism, etc. People, organizations should not be scared by a failure of political correctness and of making mistakes. This fear causes silence and the imperative must be dialogue. We need to use a carrot and not the stick. I do not think for a moment there is any cultural leader who is not interested in diversity. There may be unconscious bias. There may be a lack of understanding and even know-how. But I see it as a responsibility to help and allow those discussions to happen without anger or outrage. Awareness of the makeup of boards, selection panels, interview panels, how this affects decision-making are vital to counter unconscious or even conscious bias. As does Dee Reese, a black filmmaker, said, a big part of getting a shot is a studio exec seeing themselves in you. As a woman and a black filmmaker, I'm often not that person. I believe that different diverse stories are popular enough to attract all audiences, not just new audiences, and therefore make money. That, that is a pragmatic way to de demonstrate the importance of diversity in our industry. Without that diversity, we shall become monocultural, alienating, and soon irrelevant. We need to take both small and large steps to ensure we encourage the best talent all around us. By this I mean as a whole ecology, education, arts and media, a responsibility to inspire, encourage and nurture talent where we least expect to find it. We need to be proactive, open, less fearful of taking risks. This will empower diversity of tastes, a tapestry of stories, with ideas clashing, conflicting, collaborating, all of which is needed for our art scene to be world-leading, rich, vital, and relevant. Thank you.